Hey everyone, it's John. On today's Active Self-Protection Extra lesson of John's Brief, I'm sitting here with Mark Victor again from Attorneys for Freedom, and he is one of the premier defensive and self-defense attorneys in all of Arizona. And uh, we had a discussion, a lot of people have been asking about what do I say to the police after I've used my firearm to defend myself. We had other stuff talking about the 911 call, okay? But now the police have arrived. And we're not talking about the detectives later. We're not talking about that stuff. Now we're talking in that moment. We've had to use our firearm. The, the black and whites show up with the lights are blazing. You don't get shot by them because you got your hands clear and all that stuff. And then they're going to start asking you questions. And what do you say to them? I know what I have been trained by, nonetheless, a, um, a, an expert as Masada Yub. But I want to know what Mark has to say about that. So let's talk about it. Today's video is brought to us by the generosity of Firearms Legal Protection. Firearms Legal Protection is a legal defense program for lawful gun owners. You win the fight and they will help you win the fight after the fight for the rest of your life. There's a link in the description for a coupon code for a discount for all active self-protection watchers. Okay, so uh, his general guidelines here, and these are available on the internet, I'm not giving away his proprietary stuff, is uh, you know, is to talk about, okay, number one, that I am the victim here, right? So, not, and not talking about what I did, but what he did. So, that guy attacked me with a knife, uh, or that guy uh, threatened my wife with a gun, or whatever. So, the responding officers get there, they put you in cuffs, probably, or whatever, to secure the situation, and then the officer says, okay, tell me what your side of the story is. What happened here? Because there's probably a bunch of people with a bunch of sides of the story going on. This guy attacked me, or whatever. Here was what happened to establish that they were the bad person. Uh, Matt says, I think next to that, I will sign the complaint. So I am establishing myself as the victim here. I'm the one who is the complainant. Number three, there, here's any available evidence. So the knife is under the car over there, or there was his gun. Uh, point out any witnesses. That person, that person, that person saw what happened. So then that way they don't slink off, because people tend to slink off. And then I will cooperate fully after I speak to counsel. That's what, that, what he recommends. Um, tell me, uh, what do you recommend to people? With all due respect, I don't agree with any of that. Let's talk about them individually. Let's start with the, I mean, if you want to start with what I recommend, first of all, I would say that uh, very difficult to give advice that is blanket, general advice that applies to all situations. Like, okay. for example, what you were just discussing um, starts with several assumptions. One assumption is it's a good shooting. What if it's not a good shooting? So I know that, that, that uh, a couple of attorneys that I've talked to, and I think uh, uh, Moss as well, has said, listen, if you murdered somebody, then just shut up, because it's not getting any better. If this is a bad shooting, just shut so up. So who makes that decision right there at the scene as the cops are? I mean, would we want that person who just got into, uh, discharged a firearm, maybe killed somebody, maybe not, but discharged a firearm, and now the police are there, and they're being hooked up in cuffs, they're not going to get a complaint, an option to sign a complaint or not. That's mm. for a misdemeanor. We're talking about a felony here. Would you want that person making a, a decision on the fly about whether this is a good shooting or a bad shooting? The witnesses that he wants to preserve, the evidence that he wants to preserve. You may or may not even want that preserved, mm. right? How do we know? I mean, so we're starting from different premises here. Second, um, I think, and by the way, I probably have... I would say 100%, but there's always going to be one out there that's going to say something. It's almost like 99% of all experienced criminal defense attorneys are going to, going to agree with me on this one. We do not want our clients talking to the police, at least not without us being present. And that means after we've reviewed all of the evidence. Why would you make a statement at the scene when you have just as good an opportunity to make a statement later on down the road after you have seen all the witness statements, all the evidence, the, maybe the, the medical examiner's report, everything there is to see in the case, you can make a statement at that point. Why would you make it at the scene? We don't know what people are going to say. Witnesses lie sometimes. Things occur uh, differently. People see things differently, right? One witness may say, no, 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 the, the light was green. The other says, no, I'm sure it was red. It was either green or red. Somebody's mistaken, but they may be honestly mistaken. Mm -hmm. So Different perspectives there, happen. There really isn't a downside to just saying, look, I want my attorney. I think it's important to mention the word attorney. And you have to understand the law has evolved in a way here that if you're squishy about this, if you say mm -hmm. something like, you know, I 
think I might need to talk to my lawyer. Or what do you think? Do you think I need a lawyer? Some people ask the police officer for advice on that. Then that's not going to be effective. No. you got to be absolutely clear. And on the back of my business card, it's also, I believe, on our website, I put down in words exactly if you're going to talk what I want people to say. And it makes it very clear. And by the way, what's nice about that is... Just like the police, many of them, when they read the Miranda warnings, they pull out a card. Right. The reason they do that is because there are four aspects to the Miranda warning, and when they get questioned later, hey, are you sure you read all four? They say yes, and we say, how do you know? And they say, well, because I pulled out my card. I do it every time. This is what I read. So when they read the back of my card, it's very clear what they said. They're not going to make a statement. They want their attorney present. They're not consenting to a search, that stuff is all fine. And none of that is gonna be used against anybody. Mm. So, and also, you know, the, the police are pretty good at gathering evidence. Okay. A very, very rare situation in a shooting where uh, there was an important piece of evidence that the police didn't gather. It happens sometimes. And by the way, in those cases where it does happen, usually there's a very good argument there for the defense that the police, whose obligation it is to gather the evidence, failed to gather the evidence and mm. if it could have been exculpatory evidence then my client can't get a fair trial and so I file a motion to dismiss for that reason. So you you potentially take those kinds of arguments away and then when you say I'm going to cooperate after I talk to my lawyer, what happens when you talk to your lawyer and the lawyer says you're not going to say anything? Now you've said to the police officer I'm going to cooperate after I talk to my lawyer. And then they say, did you, did you have a chance to talk to your lawyer? You met with your lawyer. I'd like to talk to you. Now, no, I don't have anything to say. Oh, do you want that coming out on the witness stand? Because that's going to come out on the witness stand, mm. very likely. The statement that I will talk to you after I talk to my lawyer, that's probably a statement that's coming into court. And so at least it's arguable that it's coming into court. What is the implication from that statement? The implication is the lawyer saw something and decided to tell you just shut up about it that changed your mind. So I don't like any of that stuff. I see no downside to just saying, hey, I want my lawyer. I got nothing to say at this mm -hmm. time. That's what the police do when they're in shootings. That's what the police get advised to do. That's what they teach their kids to do. That's what you should do. Keep your mouth shut. Play it smart. Even if you're a good guy and you believe you did the right thing, it still makes a lot of sense to keep your mouth shut. You can talk to the lawyer right away. You might say, hey, I want to call my lawyer right now. And in Arizona, you have a right to speak to an attorney much earlier than you do under the federal constitution. You call your attorney. The attorney says, what would you like me to tell the police? To tell the police that the important evidence is here, 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 and that this guy's in a way. Okay, no problem. Officer so-and-so, uh, please, there's evidence here. There's this witness here. We can communicate whatever we want. No problem. So and then it's, it's not you making a statement. Much smarter. So, in an era of cell phones, here's what I'm hearing, Mark. Here's what I'm hearing you say. One of the things that I, both you and I, I had a, a discussion with Terry Johnson about, you know, 911 calls and, and the attorneys that I know are all worried about what you say. Because what you don't say can't be held against you, but what you do say will always be held against you. And so you got to be careful what you say. And, of course, all this bad stuff has gone on and you get, this is an actual thing, a psychological thing called logaria you get your mouth just starts running and you say all kinds of things that may or may not be true. I will say this, I've seen a lot of badge cams of officer involved shootings and you know what happens after an officer involved shooting? Here's what gets asked, they, their, their sergeant might show up real quick and look at him, you okay? You know, yeah, yeah, I'm okay man, blah, blah, blah. Okay, go sit in your car and shut up. Mm -hmm. Go sit in your car and shut up. Don't say anything, don't talk to anybody, go sit in your car and, show up, and shut up and the, then they get their lawyer, which is their union rep or whatever, and guess what happens the second the lawyer shows up? The badge cam gets turned off. And then they get to talk to their attorney. So, um, especially in an era of cell phones, I can have an attorney, and I don't think there's any reason not to. I mean, with, with uh, the number of, of programs that are out there now where you have an attorney available to you right now that you're not leafing through the phone book, that's stupid. If you're leafing through the phone book to find an attorney after you shot someone, you're, you're a fool. Um, of course, you guys know this bits. These are sponsored by Firearms Legal Protection, and I know you're part of the network of FLP, and you have a program as well that's this, a great one here. This in, is the main reason we started our Attorneys on Retainer program, yeah. so people could 
and not only have us on retainer, not only have my personal cell phone, but be able to retain us at substantially lower rates. We like doing these kinds of cases. I like being on standby. I used to be the guy who talked to the police officer. I used to represent mm. uh, the Fraternal Order of Police in these type police shooting cases. And that's exactly what the police do. Also, one other point that I think is important, uh, this isn't an issue if you're being recorded, but what if you're not being recorded? And what if the officer doesn't accurately write down what you say? You mm -hmm. say something, maybe it's a great statement, maybe it's a terrific statement, but the officer wrote down either accidentally just got it wrong or maybe didn't like you and wrote this, lied. Sometimes police officers lie. And, and let's be real, with an era of smartphones, I can either make a quick phone call, I have an attorney that picks up the phone right now, and I could, there's plenty of times where I can even FaceTime or, you know, uh, be talking face to face, and if I say I want to talk to my attorney, and guess what? That cop has to has to give you the space to do that. This is what went down. Here's what. Okay, what do you want me to tell him? Because if the if the attorney tells him something, now it's not you. The, an attorney can't perjure for you. Okay, so you've passed information on. They're going to pass it on to them. So you can say, yeah, there's a bunch of witnesses here. There's some of this stuff. And this is what happened. Okay, what do you want me to tell? Him? And they can filter that, and then you go get a, a, a good night's sleep. You don't have to make an official statement for a while. That's a whole different thing. What are you going to say with your attorney present to the investigating officers and all that stuff? But I'm hearing a lot of defense attorneys say, man, the less is more. So the let big me, thing... Let me say it like this. I can't tell you the number of cases where I would have been able to get my client either completely off or a much better deal if they had just shut their mouth. Hmm. Usually you're your own worst enemy in these types of cases. And as hard as it is for good guys who believe they did the right thing to keep their big mouth shut, right? Because we, we have confidence in our justice system. We think things are going to go appropriately. We have confidence in the officer who shows up is going to record the statement we made uh, accurately. We have, we have good, good confidence in these things. But if it doesn't go that way, do you really want to risk a decade or more of your freedom on these types of things? I don't. And so I just don't see a downside to keeping your mouth shut. And you, it's much better if you say, look, I want my lawyer... I like to call them right now because the rules are such that once you start bringing in the attorney card and you start mentioning lawyer or attorney, the police are supposed to stop asking you questions. They don't get to keep working right. on you and working on you. If you don't bring the L word or the A word, mm. they can keep asking you questions. So so maybe, what do you think of this, Mark? That, that Okay, so, and, and I have, man, such utmost respect for Masayub. That you say, okay, number five, I want to speak to my counsel. I want to speak to my attorney. I want to talk to my lawyer. Move that to number one. Love it. Mark, hey, uh, officer, I get it. I, I need to call my attorney first. I need to call my attorney right now. And and then that officer, that's a, that's a shibboleth for him or her. They now have a, a set of legal requirements as well. Because if they start going, no, you can't talk to your attorney right now. You need to talk to me. Then they're in big trouble and later. Keep in mind, this statement, I want to talk to my attorney, it's not something that comes out at your trial. It's not something that the state or the prosecutor would get to comment on. That's skipped right over. The jury doesn't get to hear that the person who's being charged with the crime said, I want to talk to my lawyer. It never comes out. Right. So there's really no downside. Those are the rules of the game, and those are the rules of the game throughout the United States. And then I understand correctly, if I say I'm talking to my attorney right now, and then this is now privileged communication, if they're my attorney, if we've got an attorney-client relationship, That's true. this is now privileged communication. Right. So if I get the, some of the logaria out there, it, it, that can't hurt me because me no. and my attorney are talking and it's privileged communication. Nothing you can say to your attorney hurts. Right. So that's like, you know, me as a pastor for 14 years, people have said all kinds of things and that clergy privilege is like, I can't, unless it's somebody's a danger to themselves or others, but it doesn't matter what you say to me, it's, it's privileged communication. And then we can do those other four things, but my attorney can do that. To the responding officer. I can go, okay, so do you want to talk to him? Hey, officer, my attorney would like to talk to you. I do that all the time. And and again, the police officers, I'm going to give them, and, and I think the vast majority of cops are great people trying to do a difficult True. job. And so they want to, to have good people uh, that, that had to defend themselves. They don't want to put those people in prison. Of course, they're dealing with people who aren't good people all the time. And so that's a thing. So to let your attorney, hey, officer, my attorney wants to talk to you. Okay. Well, remember, they always, they don't always get accurate information either. They show up and the bad guys who really are the bad guys say, oh, officer, so glad you're here. Guess what this guy did? And they, right. they feed them with all this information. A good police officers don't make conclusions, but some people do. And they, if you get identified as the bad guy, right, you're not going to talk yourself out of that. 
So remember, here's a thing for you, okay? So there's three phases of a fight, right? So you have the fight before the fight to stay out of the fight, but then in this instance, you couldn't. You had to win the fight, and that fight was maybe a deadly threat, and you had to, um, as a last resort to save your life, use a firearm or another tool to defend yourself. The second that threat ends, you are now fighting the fight after the fight. You're fighting the fight for the rest of your life. And um, as well-meaning as everyone else is, the system don't care about you as a person, okay? So you have to recognize that you need somebody on your team. And that person who's on your team is the legal ex expert, the one who knows how to win that fight. And, and you don't because un unless you are a, an experienced attorney who does these things, you don't know how that fight's going to go. And you don't want to uh, score any points for the other team. And so... Get on the phone with your attorney immediately, and you should know who that is, and you should have the business card already, programmed into your cell phone already. But, okay, I do both. I have both programmed into my phone and the business card in my wallet, because if your phone got broken or something in there, you can say, hey, I need to borrow your phone to call my attorney. Uh, and you have that number in a second location. And then, from there, then we can start doing the other things, and our attorney can do those. He can say, or she can say, hey, wait a minute, um, my client was attacked. Uh, this person attacked them and you know, here's the things officer that you need to know right now and they'll go do their investigation and you're not going to be the one who shows them stuff. And I can tell you the officer's not going to resolve that at the scene. The officer's going to say, look, there was a shooting. We're either going to not take you in or take you in, but they're going to gather the evidence and they're going to give it to a prosecutor who's going to sit down and carefully go through everything and they're going to make a charging decision. If you're going to have a discussion with somebody about charging, it's not the police officer at the scene. It's the prosecutor who's making the decision to either charge the case or submit it to a grand jury. That's the place where you can be most effective in sort of heading this thing off at the pass. I think if you do this the right way, again, you move number five, Moss is number five to number one. I need to talk to my attorney. Then guess what? I'm in this heat of the moment. I'm, I'm emotional. Everything's crazy. The, all the emotional weight of, of maybe just having to shoot someone is coming on me. But now I call a third party person who hasn't had that. They're the disinterested, not uninterested, disinterested third party who is reasonable, who is there for you. Okay, I'm on your team. Let's see what's going on here. I want you to take a deep breath. You're not going to say too much. Let me talk to him as the disinterested third party who is reasonable, rational, and in their right mind right now. You're not. Let me do the discussion for you, and then we'll get you to a place where you can decompress a little bit and then start saying reasonable things. Um, I think that's a safer way to go if you do it that way. No doubt. Awesome. Great stuff, guys. Think about that. And the big takeaway from here, your attorney needs to be ready on retainer. You need to have that number that's not... You know, oh, my attorney will be in the office at 9 a.m. tomorrow, and maybe we can hook up then. No, they know. The ones that are great self-defense attorneys, either you have their cell phone number, you have an immediate number that a lawyer is picking up that you are now instantly, you already have an existing relationship, so you have attorney-client privilege and all that stuff. And, again, you guys know we're, we're part of Firearms Legal Protection. That's what we do. The retainer, attorney on retainer program that Attorneys for Freedom does, fantastic program. That's why you got to have it, guys, because now the fight for the rest of your life is on.